All right, well, the Young Turks. Oh, God. You know, sometimes I feel sorry for the people who don't watch this show because they're not about to get entertained like you are. Okay, we have some great political stories for you guys. Oh, man, I'm going to get in so much trouble with that Meg Whitman story because I'm going to laugh in places I shouldn't be laughing. That's coming. It's coming. Okay, tell Randy Gonzalez. And then uh, Christine O'Donnell in a world of trouble. Her stories about where she went to school are awesome. Okay. And then uh, later in the program, I'm going to debate uh, someone who believes Nancy Pelosi is like some sort of gangland political leader, et cetera. We're going to have an awesome you know, interaction there is my guess. And then somebody who worked for Mitt Romney. Oh, fireworks all over today's show. Okay. Nothing but controversy. And then we got a guy who's chasing down a gay student in Michigan. He's an assistant attorney. We got a, a kid who was secretly taped having gay sex. It's a crazy show today. It's a crazy show. Okay. All right. But here's how I'm starting. I was just going through my mail a little bit. Uh, one of our original 10 members, I don't know, if you, Dave, if you want me to give your full name, so I'll leave it out. But I got what you sent me. It's awesome. Nothing to do with his campaign at all. Just one of our members who sent it in. Oh, come on. Come on, okay? No, no, you think that's good? You think I'm wearing this every day? There's no question about it, right? You're going to see this around the office. But get a load of the back. It's because he has a spine. Oh, instantly my favorite shirt. <laughs> instantly. Okay. <laughs> you know what? Now, I, I, you know, some people are accusing me of doing one long ad for uh, Russ Feingold. That's right. I am. I'm going to continue. You know what, JR? For no reason. Clip number six. Let's hope. That I want to thank everyone who helped with the 24 hour cheddar bomb. I've never seen an outpouring like that of support. Thousands of new supporters, so many cheeseheads who came together to try to make sure that this U.S. Senate seat doesn't get handed over to the corporate interests that basically already dominate Washington. We can't let that happen, and we won't let it happen. But it means we have to stop Ron Johnson, the new Republican nominee. He is planning on spending as much as $15 million to buy this Senate seat. He's already out spending us three to four to one on television ads. But we can counter it because we are better organizers. We are better with people. We are better at getting the vote out. You can help us more by visiting RussFeingold.org and really make the final push to get everyone out to vote. Vote for Russ Feingold on November 2nd. You know what? I'm going to skip to a serious story related to this next, okay? But do you know that I've actually never given to a political candidate? So for some reason, there's no ethical rules regarding Internet TV, (laughs) okay? We make our own rules here at the Young Turks. But for some reason, I had this old school thing of like, you know, just to make sure I'm not biased in any way, I shouldn't give to a candidate. Maybe it was my cheap-ass nature that, you know, coincided with that convenient ethics or whatever. I don't know what it was, right? But, you know, I don't mind telling you who I think is a good candidate and who I think is a terrible candidate, right? But I think I'm going to break my rule. Now, it, it almost sets up too much expectations for Feingold, because if he winds up pulling an Eric Massa or something at some point, because, look, Eric Massa was also a great guy and ran against, uh, you know, corporate interests, didn't take any lobbying money, and then he had a weakness for tickling young men, you know? <laughs> now, which, by the way, has nothing to do with corporate interests or anything like that. He was just goofy by that, you know, and, and so he's out now. But, look, but I, Feingold's been around for a long, long time, and you know what? If it turns out that they, he, there's some... You know, I just, anything is possible. Anything is, right? Having said that, I, I'm going to break my own rule and my own cheap assness, and I then I'm going to give the Russ Feingold, okay? So I'm going to, I think I missed the cheddar bomb, but I'll send my own piece of cheddar, okay? And I hear some of you guys are, God bless your heart. Now, okay, now look, look, look. So why am I going out of my way for Russ Feingold? Because today there was a perfect article for, uh, uh, related to Senator Ted Kaufman from Delaware. Now, his seat is the one that Christine O'Donnell is running for. I got great stories on her coming up in a second. Now, the thing is, you remember who Ted Kaufman was? He worked for Joe Biden for a long, long time. When Biden becomes vice president, they have Ted Kaufman take over his seat for two years just as a placeholder. And then uh, Biden's son was supposed to come and run because, you know, we're royalty in this country. And we don't have a democracy. We have people who are, you know, powerful. And then, of course, they hand over their seat to their sons. But for whatever reason, Bo Biden decided not to run, right? And I have nothing against Bo Biden. I don't know anything about Bo Biden. I just, I don't like the seats being handed uh, among the family. I think it's absurd. I, you know, can you imagine? 
you know, like 20 years from now, I'm like, okay, I would now like to bequeath my show to Prometheus Maximus Uger. I mean, I don't know. Is he into it? Is he not into it? Is he, does he want to do something else? Anyway, as, so, but they decide that, they're, that Kaufman is not going to run because Bo is. Bo later decided not to run himself. And at that point, Kaufman had been doing an unbelievable job in the Senate. And we've talked about him before. And he went on a warpath against the banks and said, no, 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 we've got to break these guys up. They're using taxpayer money to take these risks. Every speech was brilliant right on. And I was like, man. And I wasn't the only guy who got excited. Everybody did. So then they said to Kaufman, oh, you've got to run. You've got to run. Everybody got excited. And he said, no, I already promised not to run. You could tell the guy's not a politician. He's keeping his word. Weird, right? So, but th the reason I bring that up today is because, so they were asking him about it. Hey, maybe you should have run after all. I mean, you'd have crushed Christine O'Donnell, right? Because remember, Mike Castle was supposed to want to run and win that seat, but O'Donnell beat her in the primary, right? And he said, look, you don't understand. And this is devastating. He said, I would have never done the things I did if I thought I was going to run for office again. He said, one, I wouldn't have had any time. You have to be out there raising money nonstop. It's all about the money, Lebowski. And, I, you know, if, uh, if I... I wasn't even on the banking committee, he said. I was on the Judiciary Committee and another committee. And he said, if I, I wouldn't have had time to step outside my committees and go and get involved in the financial reform legislation. If I uh, was running for re-election, I'd have spent all of my spare time raising money because you need all of it to win. But that's the smaller point. The larger point, and he, this tells you exactly how the system is run. He said, look, honestly, I don't know that I, I could have been that forthright about what the banks were doing wrong. Uh, if I thought I was going to run again. Now, that's a, that's a huge admission on his part, and God bless him for being honest like that. And he said, look, the, they would have told me that it, it's not politically savvy, and it probably wouldn't have been. He, and so why? Why? Because he said, look, if I had went on a war path against the banks like I did, not because I, he doesn't like the banks, but because he wants to protect the consumers, he said they would have targeted me. They would have made me one of their top targets, and they would have poured in millions upon millions of extra dollars into that race in Delaware, which is a small state, and they could have just owned the airwaves because the banks would have said, all right, Kaufman's against us, we got to get rid of them. I mean, this is a sitting senator telling you how politics actually works. And he said, the system is, this is a quote, the system is so awful. He said, there, there's only one way around it, and that's public financing of campaigns. He said, but in the current Washington climate, <laughs> he said, it's not even close to a possibility. The Democrats would be, are scared to bring it up. The Republicans, of course, would want no part of it. And so the, the money dominates and crushes everything in its path. It's, it's a fascinating uh, interview with Kaufman. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you what, so that's why I bring it up in the context of Russ Feingold. Senator Feingold has definitely been targeted for elimination. Because the large corporations that he goes after all the time can't stand fine gold. So the minute Ron Johnson ran, jumped in the race, and he's a multimillionaire himself, and he's spending uh, millions of dollars of his own money, but the rest of corporate America, the banks, et cetera, were like, oh, let's go, let's go get him, let's eliminate fine gold to get rid of our headache. He's one of the few left that are actually honest and, and principled, so... Of course, uh, the corporations cannot tolerate that. He must be destroyed. No, no, no. We can't have fine gold lose. What a terrible precedent. And he'd be one of the last good soldiers. We can't have it. Everybody rushed to Wisconsin. I mean, I don't know. Take an insur internship. Do something. Go over and help. I I'm thinking of maybe catching. Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to Wisconsin in October. At the end of October. That's perfect. To get an agnostic award. I got to do something. All right, I'm going to get back to you on that. I totally forgot. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to see your ass in Wisconsin at the end of October. Hold on. i got to tell you what's going on here, and you know what's coming. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell me to console us. I'm coming. <laughs> and I'm going to bring my tools and my weapons. <laughs> okay. So, now, look, we, that's very serious and very important stuff, but now time to have some fun. Now, uh, there's a woman named uh, Nicandra Diaz Santillan, uh, who apparently used to work for Meg Whitman. She was her housekeeper. And 
uh, she's apparently undocumented, meaning that she has no documents. So uh, Meg Whitman, once she's decided that she's going to run for uh, governor of California, had to get rid of her. Okay. Now this story is complicated, and it's not clear cut. Uh, you know, did Meg Whitman do something wrong? It, my final analysis is yes, be, largely because of the hypocrisy, right? Um, and, and let me give you that quote. Actually, here's Meg Whitman uh, talking about illegal immigration and how it's unacceptable. She said, we need to build an economic fence with a strong e-verification system that holds employers accountable for following the law. Uh, according to her own campaign website, we are never going to solve the problem of illegal immigration as long as there is strong demand for undocumented labor. The kind of strong demand apparently at the Whitman household, right? So now that's what she is, in my mind, guilty of, right? And it's not a crime or anything. It's and you know, you've technically hiring an undocumented worker that might also be a legal issue. But the second side of this is the person Nikki here, who's uh, you're about to see, is being represented by Gloria Allred. Gloria Allred, don't trust anything she says. She's been the attorney for 800 sensationalistic cases. She's the one that's representing Tiger Woods' mistress, the one that comes out. And there's never been a Gloria Allred press conference where her client did not cry, okay? Not, rec not in recorded history, right? And so, like, Tiger Woods' mistress will come out and go, Oh, Tiger, he abused me. I couldn't believe it, that he would use me for sex. By the way, I will be stripping next to his golf. I'm not kidding. That's in the press conference. Oh, I you know, was terribly mistreated by Tiger, and I'll be doing a strip tease near where he's golfing, and my porno is coming out soon. So I don't trust anything Gloria Allred says. So take this with a huge grain of salt. And so the two issues are, is she a hypocrite? And if we believe, Nikki, that she's undocumented and was working for the Whitmans and, and was fired, and based on the evidence, I do believe her, then Whitman's a hypocrite. The second issue is, did Whitman somehow abuse her? All right, look, the only piece of evidence that they give is that sometimes Nikki would work she was supposed to work 15 hours a week, and sometimes she'd work longer. But Whitman, Whitman wouldn't necessarily pay for the extra time. <laughs> okay, look, I'm not going to get into the details of your contractual business with the, or, you know, the person keeping your house. Come on, come on. That's not a real issue, right? So now, as for, but you, so you can judge for yourself, we have Nikki with the press conference, with Gloria Allred, with the tears. Go. On Monday, June 22nd, 2009, Ms. Whitman left me a voice message and said that she had not yet contacted her lawyer. But under no circumstance, I was I to show up to work or stop at their house until she had a response. Then, on Wednesday, June 24, 2009, I received her call and she told me, I talked to my lawyer and he told me we cannot do anything for you. She said, I cannot help you. And don't say anything to my children. I will tell them you already have a new job and that you want to go to school and from now on you don't know me and I don't know you. You never have seen me and I have never seen you. Do you understand me? And then I said, Meg, please, can you help me? And she was very upset and said, No, and you don't know me, and I have never seen you, and you've never seen me. She yelled, Understand me? I was crying and said, Yes, and she hugged me up, uh, me. I was shocked and hurt that Miss Whitman would treat me this way after nine years. 
I realized at that moment that she didn't appreciate my work. I felt like she was throwing me away like a piece of garbage. I don't feel like I deserve to be treated this way. She treated me as if I was not a human being. I'm doing this because I know there are a lot of men out there who are mistreating the Nikis who worked so hard for them. I hope that no one else in my position has to suffer the way that I did. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Oh, please, Gloria. Please. No, no. Okay, I'm going to be the bad guy. Okay. On that count, did Meg Whitman abuse her, etc.? Not guilty. Okay. She has, she says she tr treated me like a piece of garbage and threw me out. Now, look, should she have fired her, you know, to somebody who'd been with her for nine years and said, I can't help you, etc.? You know, I would hope that you would treat people a little bit more decently like that. But did she, according to her, uh, Nikki, she felt exploited, disrespected, humiliated, and emotionally and financially abused. No, come on, wait a minute. You just, okay, look, here's what happened. You used to work 15 hours a week there. Now you don't. No, no, all the crying. I, look, if I believed it, then I'd feel bad for her. I don't believe her. I, Gloria Allred is pumping her arms. Oh, cry, cry. We're going to get money from Meg Whitman. We're going to cash in. And by the way, I don't know how they don't auto-tune that. That's got to happen tomorrow, okay? You don't know me, and I don't know you. I've never seen you, and you've never seen me. Okay, that's coming. It's coming, okay? So, no, not buying it. And you know what's going to happen at the end? Gloria Allred's going to get this poor woman kicked out of the country. She's undocumented, okay? She's going to bring this case trying to cash in. Maybe Allred gets her, you know, piece of the pie here. And then what's going to happen? They're going to be like, wait, you, you're here illegally, and they're going to kick her out of the country. It's a terrible idea, okay? So, look, if you thought Meg Whitman was the champion of making sure you get tough on immigration, no more illegal immigrants, you know that's a joke. You know she's a hypocrite. And you know she was never going to bust the employees that hire undocumented workers like herself. But if you think she abused this woman because you trust Gloria Allred and the crying press conference... I'm not with you on that. Not buying it at all. I never seen you. And you never seen me. All right, uh, now let's talk. Am I the bad guy? Oh, for making fun of her her, her, her press conference, yes. Well not the press conference, maybe for her accent and everything. Oh, okay, I am okay. <laughs> hey Seuss, am I guilty? No, I wouldn't because I I'd make fun of her too. Okay, all right. It's close, though. Close. We thought about it, okay? And uh, one other thing. By the way, why are they doing all this, right? Because Meg Whitman has deep pockets. You know, in 2007, she had a disagreement with somebody on eBay. She's the boss, of course. And she apparently pulled this woman, young woman, young me Kim, uh, into, uh, a, into some sort of uh, room to talk to her, but apparently shoved her while doing it, okay? Now, that's crazy. You're in a professional environment. You can't shove somebody, right? So, of course... Uh, she, you know, she sues, right? You know how much she got? For a little, like, you know, for a little... Rough talk him and run him off. Okay, she, you know, she'd run young me Kim off a little bit. The settlement is reported at $200,000. Oh, Meg, please come here and push me. I'll let you push me around from this end of the studio to that end of the studio. I'll let you push me all the way into the back. $200,000, $200,000. Okay, now look, I know there's got to be consequences. The boss is crazy. You can't be pushing people around, right? But once that happens, right, that's it. Then the glory Allreds of the world are like, <laughs> let me look around. Let me look around. Let me find somebody. And she sees Nikki, and she's like, all right, Nikki, here's what you're going to have to do, okay? <laughs> you say you feel terribly exploited and abused and humiliated. All right, one other thing here. Last quote from here. Uh, she, uh, oh, Nikki also said at the press conference, 
I told her that I don't have papers to work here and need her help. And apparently Whitman's husband said, uh, was very angry and said, I told you. I told you she was going to bring us problems. Miss Whitman turned to him and said, calm down, calm down. She said Whitman's husband yelled at her. I was crying for fear and intimidation with face full of tears. I told them, I believe in people. I believe people deserve a chance. I also told them that I don't wish them any harm. I just wanted their help. What do I get out of that story? The husband was totally right. Okay. It was going to be trouble, and it was trouble. You can't run as a tough guy Republican that's totally, yeah, let's get tough on immigrants, and be like, oh, you're undocumented? Who cares? Come on, come on, come on. Uh, you'll be cheaper, right? You'll be cheaper than the people who are documented. Great, fantastic. By the way, Meg Whitman, you have like a gazillion dollars. Why don't you hire someone who's legal? What, you can't pay an extra two bucks an hour? People are so stupid. Yeah. Um, I, I, there was also some of the things that the Whitman camp put out. Um, I'm not sure the origin of all of it, but they were saying these are the original papers that she forged when she hired her. Uh, you know, like Social Security card, driver's license. Um, and it's this coming from... Um, our girl that, that's doing the crying right now. Um, Nikki. Yeah, Nikki. The other Nikki's of the world. You know, <laughs> and then tax information like this. So, I mean, I don't know, this, this is some of the stuff that's put out there saying this was the actual documentation, so we were fooled from the beginning. I don't know. I'm just saying this, this, yeah, this yeah. is the Whitman case. No, no, I, and, you know, look, I'd believe it, too. I mean, I, I don't know. You'd have to really get into it. Here's who I don't trust at all, Gloria Albert. So take everything she says, not with a grain of salt, but with a granite of salt. All right. Now, when we come back, let's make fun of Christine O'Donnell. And uh, who else do I want to make fun of? i got one other great target for you guys. Oh, James O'Keefe, the guy who went after Acorn, the pimp, etc. What a wonderful moron. All right, Young Turks. All right, back on the Young Turks. Uh, what's the over-under on the chance that you don't know me and I don't know you? Winds up on the soundboard. Okay, I'm the bad guy. I continue to be the bad guy. All right, now, uh, let's, let's have a little fun with Christine O'Donnell, although she would probably be against that. So uh, she's running for Senate seat, of course, in Delaware. Now, she's said many dubious things about evolution and masturbation and how she's going to stop the whole country from having sex, all that fun stuff. But uh, she's also said some very dubious things about her own collegiate career and uh, where she's attended university. First, she got in trouble because she said that she was taking graduate level courses at Princeton University, which of course turned out to be totally not true. She uh, had signed up to audit one undergraduate class through her employer, Intercollegiate Studies Institute. But when that didn't work out, she sued ISI for $150,000, saying that they had ruined her uh, earning power that she would have gotten an extra $50,000 a year for three years. Hence, she was suing for $150,000 because she didn't get to attend Princeton's uh, graduate program. But you never had a shot. Did that, so you, were ne <laughs> you didn't even finish college. How the hell were you going to get a master's from Princeton? They signed you up to audit one class at Princeton's undergrad. You know, she sued for gender discrimination. So let's count the hypocrisies. Here's a Republican like, oh, tort reform. Oh, these people with their frivolous lawsuits. Unless it's mine, in which case it's awesome. And I'm going to make up facts about it. And I'm going to claim it's gender discrimination when it's convenient. Right? And then I'm going to put on my resume that I went to Princeton. Okay. So that's how her trouble began with her collegiate career. But it turns out she never even graduated from Fairleigh Dickinson, which is her school, until a month ago. In the middle of her campaign, finally they sent her the, uh, her degree. Okay? So that was fairly ridiculous. So then we go to point number three. She said that um, she had attended uh, Oxford University. And when I saw that, I said, wait, 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 no, no, come, 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 come. Christine O'Donnell, Oxford University. Go, 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 go. <laughs> so she has a LinkedIn profile where she claims that. Well, of course, it turns out she didn't really attend University of Oxford, per se. She was attending Phoenix University, which once rented out a room at Oxford. <laughs> go, 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 Oh, that's awesome. And now she's running into trouble again because she claimed that she had, was doing more uh, graduate work. You never even graduated until a month ago. What graduate work are you talking about? At Claremont University, of course, when reporters reach out of the Claremont University, you're going to be shocked to find out that they have no record of her attending. And when asked for clarification, her office said, oh, did we win Claremont University? No, no, no. I'm sorry. We meant it was, she attended a conservative think tank 
called Claremont Institute. <laughs> so it's one of those conservative think tanks that just have you come in and they go, congratulations, you have attended the Claremont Institute, which he conveniently changed a couple of titles and made that Claremont University graduate division. <laughs> okay. Oh, come, this is what Karl Rove was talking about. No, no, she's loony. I mean, she's uh, unsettled. Okay. And she has enormous problems with credibility, to say the least. I mean, if Karl Rove thinks you're a Republican candidate with enormous credibility problems, well, this is the kind of stuff you wind up finding out, because it turns out you've got enormous credibility problems. Uh, but I've I got to give her credit for one thing. She's got some set on her, man. I, I mean, to put on her clown-ass resume, oh, I'm pleased. I took some courses at Princeton. I attended graduate school at Princeton and Oxford. Well, she hadn't even graduated from Fairleigh Dickens. But you know, look, that's the you know, right wing ideology. If you're gonna lie, which you're gonna lie, <laughs> go over the top. Go way over the top. I can't wait for uh, to find another resume, of course, with her. Say, like, oh yes, oh did I <laughs> neglect to point out I was also at Harvard and Cambridge. I do say. Dabbled at MIT in Stanford. <laughs> Christine O'Donnell, what am I gonna do with you? Today somebody asked me in an interview. They said, oh, do you want Christine O'Donnell to win or lose? It's a funny question, right? Now, he knows I want her to lose, right? But, boy, imagine the six years of stories we'd get out of Christine O'Donnell if she was a United States senator. At the same time, I shudder at the thought. But there's some chance. You know how we have a whole sound bank for George Bush that we used to use back in the day? We, every once in a while, we'll go back to it in the post game. I'm sure we'd have a Christine O'Donnell bank. Okay. But I don't want that. That would be the last thing in the world. Look, the Senate's a very serious place. Can you imagine a Senate where there's no Russ Feingold, but there's a Christine O'Donnell? Oh. And they say, I, I'm trying to discourage people from voting. Are you nuts? I desperately need you to vote. All right. Now, um, you remember James O'Keefe? He's the guy who, he's, he's the prankster. He pulled uh, the acorn trick and got them defunded, which just makes me sick to my stomach every time I think about that and the cowardice of the Democrats to not stand up to this punk. And then it turns out, of course, they did investigations. He'd heavily edited the video. He showed himself in a pimp outfit walking into the Acorn offices. When they look at the unedited video, it turns out he never walked into the office with a pimp outfit. He had doctored the video, right? Then we saw him doctor the Shirley Sherrod video. And then based on that, Shirley Sherrod was instantly fired by the profiles and courage that existed the Obama administration. And then they had to walk that back, and then there was a controversy. So this guy's been up to us for a long time. Now, if CNN was investigating uh, him and, and other conservative groups, not investigating for anything like, oh, we're going to uncover something, more like, hey, wh what's their ideology? How do they conduct business, etc.? But O'Keefe saw this as like, oh, yeah, CNN's coming to get me. Oh, I'm going to set them up. <laughs> so... He's going to go after this reporter that they have who was uh, on this story. It's Abby uh, Boudreau, right? And he comes up with this crazy plan to get her on his boat, okay? And then once he gets her on the boat, he's going to try to seduce her. What? This is a reporter. What the hell are you doing, right? And now she made a tape of what happened uh, when he, she went down in Maryland because he said, he, he called her up and said, oh, I care about my privacy a lot. Please don't uh, you know, bring anybody else or a producer. I need you to come alone. Look, if James O'Keefe tells you to come alone somewhere, don't go, right? So she thinks, well, I'm on this story. She's actually won uh, prizes before for her investigations, uh, which, have been, which I was you know, pleasantly surprised to read about. Uh, look at this, somebody working at CNN doing a great job exposing stories, et cetera. So anyway... That's my random shot in there. But so she goes down to Maryland, and, uh, and then this is what happens. Let's, let's roll the tape for you. Clip number 11. Well, we've been working on a documentary for months now, and the premise of the documentary is to follow a, a group of young conservatives and to learn more about the young conservative movement. But we were offered the opportunity to meet with James O'Keefe, and he's probably best known for his role in the Acorn videos where he posed as a pimp. And he said that he wanted to meet with us. So I went to Maryland to meet him and his colleague, Izzy Santa. And when I pulled up to the property, Izzy was there waiting for me. And that's when this project took a very strange turn. When I pulled up to the property, Izzy was waiting for me. And she said, I need to talk to you. Can I get in the car? 
and I was like, okay. So I noticed that she had um, like a little bit of dirt on her face, her lip was shaking, she seemed really uncomfortable, and I asked her if she was okay, and the, the first thing that she basically said to me was, I'm not recording you. I'm not recording you. Are you recording me? And I was like, no. And she says, I need to tell you something. And I said, okay, every, is everything okay? You're making me nervous. She said, no, no, not everything. Everything's not okay. Um, I, I, I am a moral person. I need to tell you something. Well, what is about to happen? Tell me what is going on. And she said, you're about to be punked. Izzy told me the plan was to bring me close to the dock and then ask me if I would consent to having my meeting with James recorded on an audio recorder. If I said yes, she would get me on the boat where James was waiting and where hidden video cameras were rolling. Why is his goal to get me on the boat? She said, because on the boat, he's gonna be there dressed up and he's gonna have strawberries and champagne waiting for you. And he was gonna hit on you the whole time. She said the sole purpose of the punk was to embarrass me and CNN. I went to the backyard to see the boat for myself and to try to meet James, but he didn't get off the boat, so I walked back to my car. Then, right before I left, James walked up to me and explained that it would make him feel more comfortable if the so-called interview were recorded. You know, that's just not something I'm comfortable with is to have this conversation recorded. Plus, it's not an interview. I mean, we're, I'm just here to try to address your concerns about this upcoming shoot but um, you ended up wanting me to come all the way out here. You told me we were gonna be at your office and instead you want me to come on some boat with you and, um, and you want it to be recorded. Those were ground rules you should have set over the phone and you didn't. And he was like, well, what are you ashamed of? And that's when I said, all right, this is where the conversation ends. And um, I said to him, it was a pleasure. All right, now the person who tipped her off was Izzy Santa. She was the executive director of Project Veritas, which is what uh, James O'Keefe runs. It's an ironic name because, of course, it has nothing to do with the truth. And, uh, of course, she has been stripped of her duties. How dare you tip someone off that we were going to punk her and try to get her on a boat and try to seduce her with hidden cameras? Now, I'm about to tell you what's on the boat, and you're not going to believe it, okay? By the way, uh, O'Keefe throughout this keeps calling uh, Boudreaux in documents that uh, are now public uh, that he had wrote as part of his quote-unquote quote CNN caper. He keeps calling her a bubblehead blonde, uh, you know, ditz, basically. You know that she uh, actually, uh, before she came to CNN, uh, found out the design flaw in tires manufactured by Cooper Tire and Rubber Company as part of her reporting and started an investigation and got the product recalled, okay? So she's an incredibly legitimate reporter, this guy assumes she's an airhead, what, because she's somewhat attractive, right, or fairly attractive. So, and his idea is, well, obviously, if I get her on the boat, she'll go for me. Oh, please. Now, get a load of this clown. This is, was his list of things that he got and put on the boat in order to seduce her. Unreal. First, he starts out with A, video. Uh, so he, he says, well, number one under that, hidden cams on the boat. So tr number two is tripod, an overt recorder near the bed, and obvious sex tape machine. Okay? So the sex tape machine is to both, I guess, record and to play porn. Okay. B is props. And under B, we ha I guess we have one, two, three. Uh, his numbering system leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, number one, condom jar. You're going to need a whole jar, apparently. Okay. Two, dildos. This guy's a class act, okay? He's bringing a CNN reporter on a boat, and he says he thinks he's going to, in his own crazy mind, he's going to seduce her with dildos, okay? The whole national media took this guy seriously, okay? Number three is music. A, Alicia Keys. B, 80s romance songs, things uh, that are typically James. Oh, I fear to find out what the hell is typically James. C, avoid Marvin Gaye as too cliche. Oh, really? Okay, no, because you wouldn't want to be cliche. Number four, lube. Jesus. Number five, ceiling mirror. Number six, posters and paintings of naked women. Because, yeah, because that really turns on women. This guy's the biggest clown in the world. Number seven, playboys and pornographic magazines. Number eight, candles. 
classy. Number nine, Viagra and stamina pills. Why, James? You got issues? Okay. Number 10, fuzzy handcuffs. Number 11, blindfold. Because you know what's not cliched? Fuzzy handcuffs. I like that the one thing he crossed off the list was Marvin Gaye. But fuzzy handcuffs and dildos and the condom jar and the lube, that made it. That was fine. What a preposterous, absurd plan. What was he going to do, release, if his stupid, ridiculous plan had worked, and if she hadn't jumped off the boat, which she probably would have, and it probably would have been false imprisonment to keep her on that boat, what were you going to do, publish the sex tape? This guy is mental. ACORN, which was an organization that lasted for decades helping the poor, get legal representation, find ways to vote, etc., is gone. It's wiped off the face of the earth because of this clown, because the national media and the Democratic Party took this clown seriously. Unbelievable, man. Come on. JR. I'm, I'm, I'm calling a Hollywood PR stunt. Like any like washed up actress or, or someone who hasn't been in a spotlight enough, he's trying to get attention. He, no way he took this serious. It's impossible, but I don't know. But he walked into that into the Acorn office dressed like that and thought that people were going to take that seriously, and they did. But I don't know. There's too many things that are just no, no way he's this stupid. It's impossible. No, no, no. I, I think what he's thinking is I put all like the mirror and the sex uh, and the naked women and stuff, and I tape her right next to all this stuff and next to the condom jar and stuff. It doesn't matter if she doesn't do anything. You know how he selectively edits the tapes. Then he's going to edit the tape w with her next to the porn and go, look at this CNN reporter. She claims to be serious, but here she is on a sex boat. You see what I'm saying? You think he wasn't going to edit that tape? What, he was going to give the raw tape? No, of course, he was going to do a hatchet job on her. <sighs> Andrew Breitbart just it built this guy out of thin air, right? This it was a clown, young kid, sending Breitbart tapes. Breitbart, who, you know, has helped set up the Drudge Report and now runs his own websites. And Breitbart would take whatever edited crap video that this kid had and would put it on his front page. And the rest of the media, like dogs, followed him. Okay, they're like, oh, who, who, who should we fire? Who should we fire? Now, now, do you understand why I get mad at the media sometimes? Come on, man, do your job. Do your job. And, and you, Jr., you know this is real, because Izzy Santa got fired. I mean, she comes in and tips her off, saying, oh, my God, don't go on the sex boat. This is crazy, right? And then they fire her. You know, somebody, so, you know, I, I been, went off yesterday on the whole uh, Obama uh, and Biden coming around saying, hey, uh, stop whining and complaining uh, and basically yelling at their voters, right? And so I wrote something up about that. You can find it on our website you know, in the usual places, Fire Dog Lake, Daily Coast, Huffington Post, uh, Op-Ed News, et cetera, et cetera, right? I, I like to post online. So as usual, the Daily Coast guys drive me crazy, right? So they hate it. And it well, actually, that's totally unfair. A lot of them loved it. It was actually the highest rated uh, blog for a while, but a lot of them hate it, okay? And that's fair. Everybody's got their own opinion. The only reason I bring it up is this. There's a significant number of people on that website who think that I am secretly being paid to be anti-Obama. That there are shadowy figures, okay, who are, come in and, oh, Jake, nicely job, whitehead, Obama, here's some money. Who are these people? <laughs> who, who, what? JR, did you, where's the paycheck? Are you taking them and not telling me? Is that what's happening? Okay, all right, I'm going to look into it. Maybe it's Kohler, right? I mean, come on, man, people are crazy, man. The reality is, and the reason I brought it up in this context is, man, I hit the media so hard all the time that it's going to get me in trouble. And one day it's probably going to cost me a lot of money. Which, and, and that's okay. Hey, I made my bed. I, and, you know, and that's, that's, look, we're trying to give you the truth, and that has some consequences. But then don't come and tell me after we're going to lose a lot of money combined here because we hit the guys in power that I'm actually making money off of it. That's crazy talk. All right. Listen, let's say, speaking of crazy talk, quick break, come back with Glenn Beck with another wonderful conspiracy. Young Trucks. It ain't right, man. It ain't right. It ain't right. <laughs> okay. We're the bad guys. 
<laughs> okay, uh, Casper, I hear you got a lot of fun stories for us. I do, I do, including uh, one assistant attorney general who is bonkers. Let's have at it, Hoss. <laughs> All right, let's begin with him. All right, so uh, there is an assistant attorney general in Michigan. His name is Andrew Shervil. Mm -hmm. And apparently he is extremely unhappy about the fact that the University of Michigan uh, elected a homosexual or gay assembly, uh, student assembly president. Yes, okay. because it's true. I, I've been up all night thinking about that. Uh, and, you know, I hear there's another gay guy in another assembly at Fairleigh Dickinson. What? Who cares? Why? I know, seriously. It's the most <laughs> irrelevant thing on the planet. I mean, I, first of all, this attorney general is an alumni from the University of Michigan, okay? Oh, uh, okay, well. And then, yeah. it, even given that, it amazes me that he still keeps up with who the student body president is. Like, why do you care? Why is that important? I, I have a theory on why he cares. Oh, I have a theory, too. I mean, we all know what the theory is already. But <laughs> let me, let me uh, give you more about this story. So Anderson Cooper uh, interviewed this guy, and he talks a little bit about the different types of things this assistant attorney general did, right? For instance, he dedicated an entire blog to uh, harassing this student. By the way, the student's name uh, is Chris Armstrong. And the blog says insane things, like uh, Chris Armstrong is advancing a radical homosexual agenda. Uh, he goes in front of Chris Armstrong's home and yells, like, you're Satan and you're pushing a Satanist agenda. Crazy things. This so guy's assistant attorney general in Michigan. Yes. He's stalking uh, some gay student, right. telling him that he's associated with Satan. He's going to his house. Come now, on. Now, we have a snippet of the interview that uh, Anderson Cooper did with him, but right before I show you that, I got to list some of the things that he did specifically. Go. Okay, so uh, he posted a photo of a swastika superimposed over a gay pride flag with an arrow pointing to Armstrong's face. Now, this is something that he posted on the blog. Uh, he protested outside Armstrong's house, calling him Satan's representative on the student assembly. He accused Armstrong of seducing a previously conservative student until he morphed into a proponent of the radical oh, homosexual yeah. agenda. Yeah. <laughs> Already you're beginning to sense our theory, okay? <laughs> and it, it, he's got a whole blonde called Chris Armstrong Watch. I bet he does. I <laughs> he bet watches he does. very closely. <laughs> so uh, let's go to the interview that Anderson Cooper had with this gentleman issue is gender neutral housing what we're talking about is anybody any any man or woman wanting to choose to live together that's a radical redefinition of gender norms you say this is, a, this is uh, all just a political campaign though a you're not running for any political campaign nor is he he's already the student council president he's not some national figure and you're putting swastikas on his face and saying he's satan's representative that seems like below the belt campaigning i don't know what campaigns you're used to being involved with but don't you think that's that is beyond the pale? Well, uh, I, no, I don't think it's beyond the pale. Like I said, I, I think you're, I sense a, a lot of anger in your voice, uh, Anderson, and I don't <laughs> understand where that's coming from. Uh, as an astute observer of political campaigns, uh, you know, for many years, you know that uh, uh, these kind of tactics um, are, you know, part for the course. It appears, though, that you're obsessed with this young gay man. I mean, I've read all your blog <laughs> postings. You're, you're like perusing his Facebook, his friends' Facebook pages. You're, you're making completely unwarranted accusations, unproven accusations, based on what you're gleaning from his Facebook pages. Uh, excuse me, Anderson, who said they were unwarranted and not true? Chris has never come out and denied anything. There's a reason why he isn't giving interviews. Um, and that's uh, because he can't defend what's on the blog. Uh, the, he, uh, I mean, I stand by what's on the blog. I've gotten stuff you, from you other stand by third that he's party sources. You stand by that he's, Satan repre he's Satan's representative on the student council. You stand by well, that. Well, <clears throat> um, ex excuse me, A. Anderson, that isn't on the <laughs> blog. That's taken from another posting somewhere on the Internet I may have... Uh, put out. Um, so you don't but stand that's by my, that? That's my opinion. That's okay, my I'm, ju that's, I'm just that's, asking if you stand, stand by, by Okay, you stand by. Your boss, the Attorney General of Michigan, Mike Cox, put out a statement saying that while he recognizes your right to express your opinions, your, quote, immaturity and lack of judgment outside the office are clear. D do you worry at all that your boss thinks you're immature and, and lack judgment? Uh, Anderson, I agreed to do this interview by stating that I wouldn't make any comments regarding my employment. 
excuse me, excuse me, okay? <laughs> now look, I put the swastika over the kid's face, but why are you so angry about it? And Anderson Cooper has never been more calm in his life. Yeah, he's totally <laughs> calm. And I love the argument that he makes about uh, how this student hasn't come out and done interviews to defend himself. Because he's a student at right. Michigan being randomly attacked by a perv who's obsessed with him. He's like, well, you know, the student isn't granting you guys interviews, so it must mean that he is a representative of Satan. Obviously. <laughs> okay, how in love is this guy? He can't, no, he can't help himself. He's obsessed. He's like, I mean, you go to somebody's house, you go into his house, you're doing Chris Armstrong watch, okay? It's, look, it's just it's a matter of time, man, until you see a TYT story about this assistant attorney general caught outside a club with, you know, hey, I'm not saying anything, I'm just saying, you or know? Or doing a foot tap in a bathroom stall. Oh, come something, on. Something. Nothing, nothing has ever been more obvious. And you know what? He's never denied it. He's, he hasn't denied Excuse it. me. <laughs> Excuse me. He's never denied it. I'm going to use his logic and Glenn Beck logic. <laughs> never denied his association with the Grey Panthers and the Marxists. <laughs> okay. Come on. Dude, you're a little too obvious. Okay. You're like a Marvin Gaye song. A little too cliche. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, God. Life is so funny. You know, I somebody told me... Actually, a lot of people told me this. They said, oh, after the 08 elections, you guys are done, right? Oh, I remember that. Yeah, because there won't be any news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, news stops after 08. Yeah, that's done. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I worked now a decent amount in the so-called mainstream media and stuff. They're obsessed with, in, in, about August. They think there's no news in August mm -hmm. because a lot of people are on vacation and, and the Congress is out of session. So they're like, there's no news. There's... Are you kidding me? There's always some assistant right. attorney general excusing himself somewhere in the country, man. Are you kidding me? And there's always somebody getting fired by Meg Whitman and someone pretending to go to Oxford and Princeton. And the news is so much fun. I don't know why more people don't do it. I know. Okay. All right. So anyway, what's next? All right. Uh, a cop in San Jose, California, uh, is in a little bit of trouble after he fake arrested a 15-year-old boy for sleeping with his 14-year-old stepdaughter. Mm -hmm. All right. So the kid is 15, the daughter's stepdaughter is 14, uh, and the cop is is the stepfather. So he's, he's not step having it. He's not having it. Uh, this story is so scandalous, though, because uh -huh. the g the boy met up with the girl. While she was babysitting. Uh oh. Oh. Uh, you know what I'm saying? That's what babysitters are doing. That's what you're paying them for. Well, I didn't know that, but I do know if I could ever find it mm -hmm. that this cop had enough. <laughs> it's going to stop. And that he's going to be. I am going to be the cop that stops it. <laughs> That's literally what he went to go do, yes. as we see on tape here. So he goes to his kid, the kid's house. And the kid's dad starts taping the incident. Yeah, secretly, uh, through his phone, he's taping the incident. Now, the boy and his parents were under the impression that the cop was going to show up and, you know, have a conversation about it. You know, what can we do to prevent this from happening in the future? Instead, the cop comes in, guns blazing, and <laughs> pretends to arrest the kid. Okay, l by the way, his gun was not literally blazing, but he did, he made the kid drop his Sprite, handcuffed him, and said, you're in a lot of trouble, you little piece of shit. Right. Okay. So, now I'm going to get back to that in a second, but let's watch the video. The father of a 15-year-old boy took this cell phone video and gave it to our media partner, the San Jose Mercury News. We have blurred the faces to protect the identities of those involved. The family now wants the video released, saying it shows a San Jose police officer abused his authority when he found out their son had sex with the officer's 14-year-old stepdaughter. Growing up, being in high school, the cop's daughter is not someone you mess around with. The family's attorney says the officer showed up unannounced and took their son into a separate room. They heard noise. They heard a thud. And when they got in there, they saw their son on the floor in handcuffs. 
getting up. The video segment we reviewed is five minutes and 37 seconds long. We talked today with the officer's attorney right after she watched the cell phone video for the first time. She says it shows a concerned father who was given permission to use scare straight tactics. At no time do you hear the parents of the young man objecting, getting upset, crying. So the video uh, is absolutely exculpatory from the cop's perspective. Terry Bowman points to an early portion of the video in which the boy's father speaks up while his son is in handcuffs. Keep your head. Think about what he's talking to you about. Listen to his words. We play him in your head. The family's attorney says the officer threatened the teenager numerous times and crossed the line in using his position as an officer to settle a domestic matter. It does not bode well for you. You know what that means? No. Not a good thing that the person you had sex with is the cop's daughter. This is attorney will probably file charges. All right, so now there's a couple of awesome things in here. All right, first of all, um, I love the defense of the cop. Well, the parents weren't crying, so they must... <laughs> so I was going to continue. I mean, <laughs> right. why would I stop? <laughs> right. So, look, uh, should the cop have done this? Technically, no way, right? I mean, you're going in there, you're handcuffing the kid, you're telling him he's going to get arrested. The kid said he was really scared. And my favorite part uh, is in the story, They said, the kid says, you know, he called me a piece of shit. And I was wondering, am I? <laughs> And I started to get really, you know, worried about that. And uh, he's like, sometimes I mistreat my cousin. And I thought, maybe he's right, right? <laughs> and that really scared me, et cetera. Now, but on the tape, at the same time, you see the father is not complaining. Forget about crying, right? Mm -hmm. But the father is joining in, the one videotaping, he's joining in and saying, hey, you should be thinking about what the cop is saying, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, there's a little spotlight. Mm -hmm. And people are smelling, I don't know if they're smelling money. I don't know if they're smelling... You know. Probably. I don't deny that at all. I mean, I, I think that that is a huge possibility. But regardless of what the parents' intentions are, the cop shouldn't have done that. Plain and simple. Like, you don't, you don't do that. You don't abuse your power. His whole purpose was to scare this 15-year-old boy from having sex again, right? Mm -hmm. Is it really going to work? Well, that's interesting, because at the end of the article, the kid says, eh, to be honest, it kind of worked. He's like, now I'm no, scared he, to have sex with his daughter. He, well, he's right, because you know what? He was. I'm coming to your house. You're going to get it. I am going to be the cop that stops it. And it turns out he did. He didn't say it worked. They asked him whether or not, uh, what he thought about teenage sex, and he said, I wouldn't recommend it. This 15-year-old boy is going to go have sex again. Like, well, I hope so at some point no, in his life. No, no, okay. at some point in his life. But, but here's what he's not doing. He's, he's not going back to that cop's house. He's not going back there. Let me clarify. <laughs> He's going to have sex again within a couple days. Okay. A cop coming to his house. Because, look, everybody, at this point, the media, his parents, everyone is saying the cop is in the wrong. And that's totally taking the attention away from what the 15-year-old did and focusing on the cop. So he's not going to think what he did is that big of a okay, deal. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. On the cop, not guilty. Let him go. Let him go. What? I'm letting him go. You're insane. No, I'm not insane. No. Look, I get that what he did is wrong. Here's what I would do if I was the, uh, you know, the his boss, right? The cops officer, like, tut, tut, tut. I am putting you on semi probation. You'll get to keep your job. You'll get to come in. You'll get your salary, but you will be on probation for a couple of weeks. Look, man, this is old school, man. This is how we used to settle things back in the day, okay? Somebody sleeps with your 14-year-old daughter, and you go to their house, okay? And you straighten shit out, and you put a couple, a couple of handcuffs on the motherfucker, and say, listen, you little piece of shit, you do this again, and I'm coming back, and next time I'm not going to be polite about it. That's, that's how, ah, look, I'm from the old school, you know what I'm saying? I'm with Mike Singletary. Okay, hold on. I know it's from the old school. All right, but I can't you, you find. have a son, okay? No, no, no. Let's let's personalize this. Okay. Little let's... Prometheus, okay? Okay. Yeah. He's 15 years old. He sleeps with some 14-year-old girl, and the girl's father comes to your place with Wendy there and Prometheus there, and handcuffs him, tells him he's a little piece of shit. Uh huh. What do you think about that, Uger? Uh huh. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. <laughs> So, now, here are my thoughts on that. Okay. It's unacceptable. No, no, I pull the cop aside and be like, look, look, we're just scaring the kid, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? If we're just scaring the kid, I'm on board. Okay? I hear you, man. Your 14-year-old daughter got stuff with I hear you. He's a bad kid, all right? He's not a bad kid, but go ahead, go ahead. You, you earned it, right? 
Uh, but just don't do anything crazy. Don't pull a gun or anything like that. And the cop's going to say, of course, right? Mm -hmm. And then he's going to do what he's going to do. And then after the cop leaves, I'm going to say to him, hey, listen, you see that? From now on, you sleep with the fireman's daughter, not the cop's daughter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and look, you know, a little high five. But look, you know, you got to be careful. You know, you can't. The babysitter. Oh, that's good work, bro. But I'm just saying, okay, now you got to be watch out for this guy. This guy's serious. See, that not that how we used to resolve things back in the day, JR? By Who's... fake arrests. <laughs> okay, I mean, I don't know. You, you knew with me? Well, this is the thing. I, I really thought I was going to be alone on this. It was a fake arrest. Yeah. He didn't take him in. He didn't yeah. actually arrest him and try and come up with some trumped up charges. He just scared the kid, which I don't know if it really works fully. We're still trying to figure out. I mean, or at least we're debating that, but come on. What was the real harm? It's what was the real harm it's, again? It's, it's an abuse of his power. Like you He didn't do anything. Yeah, he did, though. No, he did. He <laughs> did. I mean, look, it's a false arrest. He shouldn't have done it. Well, we, yeah, don't get me wrong. I mean, I hear you. It's, you can look, call look, it a false here's... arrest because he held the kid. You know, obviously the kid didn't feel free to leave. He was handcuffed, et cetera. He misused his authority on a personal matter. I get all that. Two weeks of kind of probation. You know no, and you know, let me just say one thing. When it comes to consequences for the cop, I don't even think probation is necessary. Just have someone talk to you and, you know, tell you that's wrong, don't do it again. That would be fine with me, right? Okay. The thing that worries me about this is, okay, so you don't want this, this 15 year old boy to have sex with your 14 year old girl. That's fine, but they're going to have sex again. They're going to have sex again in a couple oh. of days. So why don't they, you... I'm telling you, I think you're wrong, man. Because, look, he, that kid, all right, I mean, he's, he's working the Let babysitters around something. the neighborhood. Nothing okay, tastes he's sweeter. in good shape. Nothing tastes sweeter than the forbidden apple. I, I mean, <laughs> okay, look, <laughs> you, you might have experience on that I don't, I'm not familiar with. Well, okay, I'm just, all I'm saying is he going to think twice next time he steps in that house. I highly doubt it. I think that they should have talked to them about contraception. <laughs> Oh, here we go. All right, look, uh, the thing is, he might have thought twice until all this hubbub, though. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm worried about, the hubbub. You see what I'm saying? Because now he feels empowered. Like, oh, the cop, yes. the cop was wrong, and my parents say we could have a lawsuit and maybe make money off this. Let me go hit her again. Oh, and he you will hit hard. <laughs> <laughs> he will. Okay, but that's, see, but that's why I don't like that we've undermined the cop's authority there. You're done. Okay, it's, all right, then final thing, because now she's got me curious. Chief Justice, what, what are your thoughts here? Um, I'm on board with what you were saying. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's okay to scare the kid. I, I, I mean, I'm still surprised that the kids are 15 and 14. I think that's a bigger thing to me. I'm like, she's only 14. Yeah, that's <laughs> pretty damn young, right? Yeah. yeah. And he's 15. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't yeah. anywhere close to that when I was. But 15. but I, I think yeah, I think he's scared. Yeah, of course he's gonna be scared. I won't do it again. And it's, yeah, if the cop came to your house, if that was your situation and you were the fifteen year old kid, uh, would you think like, ah, oh, well, what am I gonna do? Yeah, well, I'd be scared. I mean, if right. he was coming to right. arrest me. Right. Yeah. But you, I mean, there ain't no lawsuit or nothing. No. Yeah. Totally. No. Look, you gotta let cops be cops. Yeah. Okay. He didn't tase the kid. I think it would have been also just as effective if he would have came without uniform. I mean, the kid still knows he's a cop, you know, and said, right. hey, you know, I'm still going to arrest you next time or something. Yeah, well, bring the handcuffs. Borrow, yeah. uh, b borrow James O'Keefe's fuzzy handcuffs. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're all clear on it. All right, when we come back, I get, we got more students in sex. Oh, we have a tragic story. We too. do have a tragic story. All right. Okay. All right. Come back for that. It's fascinating.